Welcome to the virtual Regeneron ICEF Innovation and Entrepreneurship Panel. Today, you will learn that innovation continues long after you complete your educational goals. Our alumni are redefining what's possible. They are collecting data from high altitudes to help humanity adapt to climate change, developing human to computer interfaces, creating better medical data systems and automation, and allowing medical professionals and patients to make better choices that improve resulting outcomes. Not too many years ago, these entrepreneurs were finalists at ISAF. They competed, they made friends and connections, and many are still in touch through our alumni network. We know our world is rapidly changing and it's up to all of us to find new solutions to these ever evolving challenges as we look ahead to the breathtaking possibilities of the next century, we invite everyone to understand and engage in the science that's transforming our world. I'm thrilled to be here today with three impressive alumni who are leading entrepreneurs. It is my pleasure to introduce Paige Brown. Paige is the founder and CEO of Windborne Systems. Paige studied material science at Stanford and has been leading the team that turned into Windborn since 2017. She is a Thiel Fellow and won first place at the 2016 Science Talent Search. She parlayed that experience into internships at Lockheed Martin and SpaceX. She ran the Stanford Student Space Initiatives Balloons team and represented the project's work to the Federal Aviation Administration, NASA, and industry insiders for several years. Paige was also an ISEF finalist in 2015 and 2016. Welcome, Paige. Thank you. David Holtz is the CTO and co-founder of Leap Motion. Prior to founding the company, David contracted for NASA's Langley Research Center and conducted neuroscience research while at Max Planck's Institute. He studied applied math at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill ultimately leaving his PhD program to co-found Leap Motion in 2010. David was a 2006 ISAF finalist. Welcome, David. And Ramji Shirnivasan. Driven by a goal to make preventative medicine achievable with improved molecular screening, Ramji co-founded and served as CEO of Council, where he aimed to make preventive medicine achievable with improved molecular screening. Ramji earned a BS in computer science and an MS in financial mathematics, both from Stanford University. He was a 1999 ISEF finalist. Again, thank you so much for the three of you for being here. So let me start with the first question. How are y'all doing? Like, how are you, how are you doing in this, in this incredible new normal we're living in? Um, Ramji, I'll start with you. Me and my wife are bouncing off the walls. We're both extroverts, so but we are have each other and our dogs, so that that makes for life that's fun. And you know, we're we're all obviously very lucky and blessed that you know we're we're safe and healthy during the, this whole time. So you know, we're, we're doing fine overall, but I think we're just we're going a little stir crazy. How about you, Paige? Um, it's going pretty well. Uh, I am really taking this as an opportunity to get outside more and go for go for hikes wherever I can. Um, me and my roommate have been going on a lot of hikes in the weekend. Um, I've been reading a lot, um, so uh, dealing with things pretty well. How about you, David? Uh, I'm in the middle of the city, so I try not to go outside unless it's in virtual reality. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I have a roommate. I, I mostly just stare outside of a window and just talk to friends on the on voice every day. And as long as I'm, you know, there's different people to sort of hang out with over voice, I feel feel okay. So, th thank you for coming back as alumni, right, to to ISEF. Tell us about go back to when you remember your ISEF experience, and and how that links to what you do today versus that ISEF experience and project you did before. Um, Paige, I'll start with you. Sure, sure. So um, back when I was uh, an ISEF finalist, my research was in environmental engineering and I was focused on mitigating uh, the effects of stormwater pollution. And uh, it really turned me on to the ways that, uh, that the climate and that uh, the environment is impacting us in a day-to-day -day basis. And 
really that that love of understanding and mitigating climate change really is what drove me to what I'm doing today. I realized that there's other ways that the climate is impacting us. And one of those very um, pernicious ways is through extreme weather. And so um, that's why I started Windborne. It's a, it's a next generation weather company that uses long duration balloons to target um, high value data in the atmosphere to get more accurate weather forecasts. The other way that ISEF really helped me is it, it got me out of my shell um, and it, it kind of taught me the, um, the way to channel my curiosity into a way that, that can actually have an impact on the world and how to be a good storyteller to get people to care about my work. How about you, David? Um, uh, storytelling, actually, that, that was a really, that's really one of the, the things that you, uh, I always worked on projects and I always had something going on in my head or, you know, in some lab, but, you know, but really having to get out there and tell a story and, and have that crafted and, and say it over and over and have a presentation is, you know, really, I think probably one of the most impactful things because, you know, when you, whenever you build something and you got into the world, you know, it doesn't matter what it, you know, how much time you spent on it, how good it is, at the end of the day, you have to show it to someone, you have to explain what you did and what you learned and, what, and then what worked and what didn't work and you have to tell a story and, and that was something that, that Isaac really, Isaac really helped for me. Ramji? For me, my project was driven out of our, me and my buddy's fascination with fast cars and, and driving quickly. And we built a brake light that could, you know, basically tell you whether or not you were tailgating somebody else or somebody was tailgating you. And so ISEF taught me, and it was uh, basically emergency uh, brake light technology. Long story short, it was, it was very practical and it really taught me a love of engineering and, and building in teams, which, and carried through me all towards my, my, my days in women's health. So I, I am very grateful for myself. So let's talk a little bit about the world we're living in right now. How are all of you dealing with uncertainty at this time? Um, Ramji, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, you know, I think the, it's, 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 it's challenging because I think in the long run, we'll be okay. But in the short run, there's obviously massive dislocations that are happen, happening. And I think new companies will get created now. New ways of doing business will happen. And it'll expose many vulnerabilities that we as a society will build antibodies for. So in that sense, I'm a perennial optimist about the world and ingenuity in people and, and our ability to recover and improve from this. I think the... And as far as uncertainty specifically, like I think the, there are many things that are out of our control. And I think um, the things that we're trying to do are just to stay focused on our own work and our own missions and, and so on, as opposed to getting wrapped up in a news media cycle. How about you, David? Yeah, I mean, I think that always, it's always uh, important to kind of be calm and, and find, you know, I think it, if it use this sort of moment in time to, to do something that's exciting, whether that's helping helping somebody. I, I had a friend who was uh, uh, an entrepreneur who, who had a had a mask company, and I was thinking, boy, I don't know what it'll ever what it'll ever do to know somebody who has a mask company. And all of a sudden, now I was helping them find you know find hospitals to fly things into. So I mean, obviously, not everybody has a friend with a mask company, but the idea is that whatever things that are around you, maybe you have uh, the ability to to be a part of the conversation in some way, whether that's helping somebody understand something they don't understand or, or even just taking the time to, you know, read some books you've been wanting to do and work on some projects you've been wanting to work on, you know, um, you see it as an opportunity if you can, I think. How about you, Paige? Yeah, so the, I find that the way that I deal with uncertainty or, or difficult situations is by trying to understand the situation as, as, as closely as possible. So one thing that I find myself turning to is reading like uh, research papers on coronavirus and, and trying to understand um, understand like both the um, scientific side of it and also the sociological side of it and trying to just understand the situation to minimize the uncertainty of what's going to happen next because I think that's what's really getting to everybody is we don't know is there going to be another wave that's going to get hit how long are we going to be in quarantine there's all these open questions and the way that I'm kind of arming myself against that uncertainty is by trying to understand those questions from the base science up. You know, um, have you, I, I'm going to uh, turn this a bit, have you remained involved in 
science fairs local or ISEF or science education since participating. Um, and, and I see David's head shaking. Yes, David, do you want to take that on first, and then I'll. Oh, I mean, I, I try to always. I, I've, um, yeah, I mean, I, I used to judge at the. I mean, after going to ISEF, I I would help with judging the county fair from the county that I grew up in. That was really cool. I think I had won, you know, uh, more awards in the county than. Yeah, you know, it was it was a lot. So that, it was fun to come back on the other side. It's really interesting, actually. I would say any of you that ha that have that have been in a fair try to come back and support it or even eventually try to judge out. And it's really interesting being on the other side and understanding sort of the whole thing. It's really unique. Um, I've been trying to do the same thing in the, in the Bay Area, actually. Um, and you know, I, think, I think it's maybe important to say the science fairs never have enough support. You can always use more support. And so even in a place like the Bay Area, where you think that this is all about technology, they, they actually still need help finding judges very often, you know, and it's just amazing. And so some, and a lot of times people don't even know about it. So I just try to tell my friends, you know, this is thing called the science fair and there's cool projects and smart kids and you should come by and help. And, and most of the times like you'll find other professionals in your field eventually, they don't even know. And so just like telling them, bringing them in, you, you know, makes a huge difference for, for everybody. And you've been an ISEF judge, right, David? Yeah. 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 Okay. Many, several times. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Ranji? Actually, I, I haven't, and uh, I'm very glad to connect with you and the rest of the team to, to get back in the game. So I, I think it's it's awesome, and it's so motivating to see this, especially with the reach and amplification you have today. Like, the I think the more and more students who are encouraged to go down this path of science engineering or the life sciences, it's great. I was a ex-financial service person, and like many people, you know, I, I I'm like, there's so many brains that are being wasted on Wall Street and doing consulting, and if they can be, you know, think that science is cool or they, their work has a real impact, I think that's awesome. How about you, Paige? Yeah, so I've actually um, judged at the Bay Area Science Fair twice, and that was a, a really fantastic experience to get to meet all the kids and see what they're doing. Um, the first time I was a, a special awards judge for NOAA, and the second time, um, actually just this past year, I went in and they made it a virtual science fair and I was judging um, the environmental engineering category for the middle school. And I was just blown away by how advanced the project that the, the projects that the kids were working on. It's, it's amazing. Um, they, and you know, with the middle schoolers, they don't have access to any um, institutional research. Um, they can't like go to a university and work there. So it's all just stuff that they've been doing in their kitchens. And it's, it's really amazing the, the work that they've been able to do. So, you know, thinking back to how you viewed the world as a high schooler and as an ISEF finalist, what do you hope the finalist will gain from experiencing a virtual global event like this? This is open, and it's not only the, the finalists, it's open to all participants of science fairs, it's open to all STEM students. What are you hoping that these young people and everyone gets from this this week? Uh, David. I mean, a, a big thing that you get in the science fair is, you know, the ability to identify problems and, and work on solutions. And I think to the extent that, you know, you've been successful here, you can be successful outside as well. And, you know, most, uh, most of the world is not made up of, of ICEF contestants right. or science fair stars. Most of the world is made up of all the regular people at your schools who didn't do those things. And just like how you might find yourself in a place where like, wow, I can, I can explain this stuff. Wow, I can do research. You're just as distinguished you know, in every other area. Uh, and so if you go out there, you know, just like you, you feel like you, you can feel our support here, you'll have support outside as well. So like, uh, that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's really important to know because it's not fake. We're actually supporting you out of a real, out of a real place for, you know, you're, you're, you're all real stars. How about you, Ramji? Well, you know, it's a really interesting crucible moment. So I, I'm hoping that students get a no excuses mentality and resilience that it's like, you know, no matter what the world needs to go on and, you know, being able to demo their work, get feedback from their peers and advance and move forward. It's, you know, just because this event is happening doesn't mean that, you know, they're, they, they need to stop their work. In fact, quite the opposite. Their work is probably more urgently needed. So that's what I hope is that, that sense of resilience. Paige? Yeah, so one thing that I, that I really believe is that innovation comes from moments of, of pressure. And I think that this is, a, this is an intense moment of pressure. And I think that, I, I really hope that all the people participating in science fairs and will realize that around them, um, there's, a, there's hundreds and thousands of these brilliant minds 
all kind of being pressured into thinking of the next great solution to, to the problems that we're dealing with. And that gives me a lot of hope. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really inspiring to see um, what, when I was at ISEF, um, just to see all of, the, all of the amazing projects and to see all these kids who devoted months of their lives, sometimes years of their lives, to understanding and, and expanding the curiosity about a subject. Um, and uh, it's that that translates into actual real world impacts. And, uh, you know, when these kids grow up, they're the ones who are finding the next vaccine for a coronavirus or finding the solution to the climate crisis. And uh, it all it all just starts in this sort of incubator of science fairs. So I'm going to ask just a, a, a really fun question. I don't know if it's going to be fun when I ask it to you. But um, what is one favorite item you've cooked at home since the shutdown? Anybody want to share like what what somebody might have cooked that's interesting? Ramji? Yeah, my wife and I make veggie burgers with with the jalapenos. So those are awesome and we start coughing like maniacs and so yeah, those but it's still fun and they taste great. So. <laughs> How about you, David? This Pasta with butter in it. I never knew, but you just put butter in something and it tastes really good. And <laughs> I, you know, just, if you just have something, just put butter on it. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> How about you, Paige? <laughs> I, um, last weekend I made a really good chicken dumpling soup. It was the first time I'd ever made a soup, um, but it actually turned out pretty good. Um, the, the dumplings had um, chopped up fresh rosemary that I stole from a neighbor's garden. Um, so it was, uh, it added that extra special culinary flair. Good for, good for you guys. So I'm gonna ask some specific questions to, to each of you just around uh, the work and the, the sort of your the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, David, your career has had some exciting pivotal moments from neuroimaging to space and laser technology to founding Leap Motion and working in 3D motion control technology and virtual reality. What do they all have in common? And, 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 you know, and after that, how did you, how did Leap Motion come to be? And where is it today? Um, well, so, I mean, people sometimes ask me, like, why, why, why do you like space, David? And I'm like, well, I like, I like the universe, and most of the universe is in space. And so, like, there's a space, like, everything is in space, and space is sort of everything. That's the universe. I was always really interested in that. I wanted to work at NASA as one place. To work on that and then you know you could also say that everything's in the mind so like i also wanted to work on brains and neuroscience and, and that was really exciting and then as i work on these sort of everything fields i very much realized that often the limit is actually in sort of bridging them and and so you know how do you take the the you know the the, the, the sort of as a person how do i how do i bridge like how do i the, the, the things that link us to all these things around us so um in particular with leap motion I often felt like that the limit in technology wasn't the size or the cost or the speed, but how we interact with it. It doesn't matter how smart we are, how popular technology is, what we do together comes from how we work together. And so I wanted to work on sort of that fundamental, the interactions in between them, the human computer interface problem. And so I, I built a company specifically to, to focus on that. And uh, so kind of moving from working on everything broadly to try to working on sort of fundamental problems that bridge gaps between fields and enable and empower people. And that's where, that's where I am today. And, uh, yeah, uh, we have um, kind of a, a big conglomerate now with 150 people that work on everything from um, ultrasonic, uh, uh, from hand tracking to like uh, uh, phased arrays of ultrasonic transducers that can make you feel things in the air without touching anything. So it's uh, pretty cool. Lots of tech. I originally at Science Fair, I guess I was doing, uh, I wanted to actually use like, I wanted to like try to actually track hands in, in high school actually like a, but with using sound waves like a dolphin and I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I tracked sound in 3D with microphone arrays built into my board. And, uh, and I kind of cool to, to, to go from that to tracking hands with cameras to now going back to having ultrasonic, uh, you know, arrays of hundreds of ultrasonic transducers that focus sound and can sense things and sweep things around the room. And it's pretty cool. So yeah, if you keep going down a path, you'll get there. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Ramji. Um, Having founded and led a company's primary focus uh, was the health of women and young families. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about Council 
Um, but how did you balance business and growth without losing sight of the human side of, of the work you were doing? Yeah, so the, the first part of it, Council was a, is a clinical lab that serves women and their families at different, li- at, at different points in life. So parents planning to have kids, women in their first trimester, and then women at risk of breast and ovarian cancer. So we tested individuals all across the U.S., over a million patients ser- served by the time we sold the company. The, the, those were, I always thought of those as, as critical decision points that a woman and her physician could use together to guide the next step. But the impact of this is extremely powerful. And, you know, you don't want to just land a negative, a positive test result on somebody you're, you know, the, you're, or you're carrying a fetus that may have a potential probability of Down syndrome without appropriate counseling. Can you imagine like getting an HIV diagnosis and just reading it? And like, we just felt like being able to introduce that with the appropriate counseling was one way to introduce a human aspect to it. So we created a system on council.com slash counseling where it was like tap to speak to a genetic counselor, like an open table style booking system. So then you could talk to somebody and work through all the emotions that are associated with that anxiety, fear, et cetera, and then come up with a, with a treatment plan with you, you and your physician. So we thought that human side was absolutely essential because without that, you know, you will just create unnecessary anxiety and, you know, distress. And it's a very preventable process. Um, And Paige, Mm -hmm. um, global events uh, such as COVID-19 sometimes has us speculating about how soon we'll be able to colonize planets like Mars. Do you think your current atmospheric research will ever take you beyond Earth? Tell us a little bit about windborne systems and, and, uh, and whether we can go beyond Earth. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually an area that I, um, I have a lot of passion about. Um, I, so I think, that, I think that the specific research that, um, that windborne systems is doing isn't meant to go beyond Earth because Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. Um, that being said, this is, this is something I'm really excited about. And personally, you know, when... Um, my my goal is to eventually get a PhD in in situ resource utilization and um, and take that and become an astronaut and go to Mars um, because I think that um, I think that there's there's kind of two big big problems that humanity is facing right now and obviously there's a bazillion other problems but the two ones that I've really focused on are climate change and the fact that we're a single planetary species um, it puts us in the crosshairs of a lot of risks um, if something were to happen on Earth that could potentially be it, um, an existential threat to humanity. And the only way we can mitigate that is to get people off of the planet and start colonizing other planets like Mars. Mars is the, is the test bed. That's where we, where we got to start. And I'm super excited about the potential of that happening within my lifetime. And I'm going to be a part of that. I want to be part of the, the team that's going out there and building up the colony on Mars and um, actually uh, taking the materials that that's what in situ resource utilization is. It's taking the materials that are in the environment and repurposing them to create um, structures and to create like landing pads and storage facilities and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's uh, that's where I want to w- w- end up. I, I definitely think that uh, that this is something that's going to happen within our lifetimes, and I'm super excited about it. So Ramji, you sold your company. What are you up to now? Like, what's what are you thinking about these days? Well, initially, I was just really enjoying re- relaxation, and now I'm looking at a couple of initiatives in blood draw, and specifically helping labs like my old lab get access to blood specimens. The two areas at Council that I was really interested in the periphery were the immune system and infectious disease, which have now exploded, and they're companies which are you know, basically sequencing your close to your immune system and, and helping identify which therapies work and and, and which don't. So I'm actively looking out for different scientific technologies that might be suitable to bring to market in addition to looking at this uh, phlebotomy initiative. But I really recommend the relaxation. So I I, I think I've been in the company for about 11 years and then took time off, learned some combat sports like Muay Thai, Mm -hmm. then, you know, learned snow sports like skiing and then got married. So I, I, I did enjoy that time off. David, what about you? What are you thinking about these days? Uh, even with Leap Motion, 
moving forward and growing, are you in the phase of scaling Leap Motion or are you in the phase of thinking of something else? I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, I'm trying to do both. So like, you know, I think Elon, uh, I, I, I'm a bit inspired by Elon Musk where like over the years, he doesn't just, you know, he doesn't just work on one thing, but he has lots of different things that he jumps between. And so like the, there's something uh, I, I've been, I've been pretty all in for, for the better, for the better part of a decade. But, uh, but going forward, it would be really nice to, to kind of start to branch out and have lots of things with like really cool people that I can jump between and build in. And so I'm looking at a lot of things like that. And Paige, you know, you're in, the, you're at the beginning stage of Windborn. So I, I, I'm going to actually turn around a question to you. You grew up in rural Maine and learned a lot about scientific and social, you know, micro sort of ideas, you know, in your community. What were some of the most important lessons you learned growing up in Maine? that other finalists from small towns may be experiencing right now? Hmm. So um, I'd have to say that the biggest thing that I personally got out of, out of my childhood is, is really my love of nature. Um, I, I realized the impact that, uh, that nature had on my community and the impact that it had on my own life. And I, would, I grew up like playing in the streams near my home and that really informed my, um, my following interest of studying stream ecosystems and understanding the pollution. Um, I think that for, for people in these, um, in these small towns across America, it can be hard to get access to, um, to like the kind of lab equipment that you need to, to do a, a fancy science experiment. It can be hard to get to a university research lab where you can do, you know, like cutting edge cancer research. But what you can do is, is you can get creative. It really teaches you creativity. Um, like for, for me, it was, um, I built up a, a lab in my basement with my parents' help and with my teacher's help and, and really um, tried to, tried to um, like I was using like kitchen equipment. I was, I was sticking pots of, of, uh, of chemicals. You probably shouldn't do this, but sticking pots of chemicals in the, in the oven and uh, um, using that instead of like a lab scale oven. It, it, it's, you know, there's, there's ways to get creative and, and to, um, and to like try to create something new without, without having access to a, a large scale lab facility. And um I, I just think that that actually comes across really well sometimes in science fairs when you understand that um, like the judges will will get that they'll be like they'll realize that um, that you didn't have the resources that other people did have and um, they understand that it, it kind of shows something about you it shows that you have the fortitude and the creativity to make it work even when other people um, you, even when you didn't have the resources that other people had. Thank you. Um, so before we move on to the finalist questions, I have a, a, a quick question to ask you. When the lockdown is all over, what are you most excited to do? David? Uh, just do really long walks around the city again. Uh, I, I, I'll probably I might travel to some Airbnbs. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. How about you, Ranji? Go for drinks with my wife and friends and then also hit the gym. <sighs> How about you, Paige? Um, I'm planning a, a hiking trip with my parents to the John Muir Trail. Wonderful. But wonderful. Okay, so I'd like to now turn it over um, to questions from some of our finalists. This question is from Rohan Patel in Florida. My question for the panel is, how has an understanding of both science and technology been necessary for a successful career such as yours? I'm going to start with Ramji first. Well, yeah, thanks for the question. In, in my case, I, I was actually a rube or rookie when it came to science, and I learned from my co-founder who taught me how to pipette and, and so on. So in some sense, the business part of understanding what customers need pulled the, what needed to be done in terms of scientific technology. So I, was, I think for a little bit, as, as a team, we were able to complement each other in terms of strengths and understand what customers needed and then build the technology to suit their needs. So I think I, I was 
I wouldn't say fluent in, in molecular biology and, and, pi, and pipetting and, and so on, but I was conversant. And that was, you know, understanding my, my co-founder and my colleagues' team strengths and understanding the customer need created a very, very virtuous cycle where we were constantly iterating and coming up with great, great new tools that could, that could serve and benefit customers. I think if you, you want to pick one thing, it's understand that customer need because then you can back solve technology. One big mistake is just to create technology and say, well, it's cool, somebody might use it, but if you don't have a very specific pain use case in mind, maybe many years before you actually figure out what that's for. So in the context of a business, it really matters to figure out what that pain use case is. How about you, David? Uh, so I guess I was, I was a technology, I was sort of a, a business noob when I, when I started my company. Um, there are definitely two types of business that I've done. One is you, you build something cool and you sell to somebody who wants to pay money in exchange for that goods or services. And you know, that, that can be great if, you, is, if, you, if you're good at telling stories, then you can kind of imagine being the person who's, that story is being told to. The story can be a sales pitch as much as it is a technology pitch. Um, I think outside of sort of directly selling to like a regular person, you might find if you enter the sort of the business world of adults doing business with adults, uh, it's not often, it's not necessarily just about a story or just about like uh, the benefits of a, one thing versus another. It's about relationships too. And that like people don't want to just buy a product. They also want to work with friends. And so sometimes really cult, you know, investing not just in the development of your technology, but in the development of your friendships and your relationship with, with your peers in, in the field that you want to work in actually can be, can be just as important as technology. And Paige. Yeah. So um, I think that, Oftentimes people don't pay attention so much to business and that's definitely true of me when I was at ISEF. I, you know, I, that was the furthest thing from my mind, but uh, in, in kind of retrospect and as I'm learning more about business as go, going through this venture with Windborn, um, I'm sort of realizing that the, that there, there is a, there is a close tie between business and, and, um, and science in, in the purpose and kind of like what Ramji was talking about, it's you've got to understand the purpose of why you're doing what you're doing. And that informs, that informs um, like what type of science you're doing, what, what your hypotheses are, what you're building. Um, it's, all, it's all driven by, there, there has to be a real world need for, for what you're creating. Um, and uh, that, that definitely um, became clear to me as I, as I started to learn more about business over the last, over the last really year or so. Um, and, uh, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely, there's a critical relationship and where those come together and where those really thrive is in entrepreneurship. Um, and, uh, yeah, so overall you just need to really understand the, the driving force behind why you're doing what you're doing. And that's, that's kind of where the, the strength in your project comes from. Um, you, you've got to understand who you're building for and why. So I'm going to keep asking questions from around the world and I'll pick one or two of you, you to answer each of them. So uh, we're going to mix it up a bit. Um, from Brazil, we have Fabricio Atunes who asks. So my question is in Brazil and in many other countries, uh, entrepreneurship is still present itself as a very market oriented practice. Uh, the later characterized by the competitiveness. Uh, when I think of science and research excellence, I think about scientific development based on exchange and collaboration. So how is it possible uh, to be an entrepreneurial researcher without denying uh, the ethical and collaborative values that involve the research practice? Who'd like to take that question on? Yeah, Ramji. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point, which is I, I think great entrepreneurship builds upon other tools. And like if you look at companies like Tesla, where they're releasing their IP to the world or other companies like Gilead, which are curing hepatitis C, they are publishing that research in many cases. So I think I don't think those two aims conflict. In fact, a lot of the great technology successes are built upon each other and, and linking these technologies and creating ever accelerating you know, benefits for, for either patients or, or in, in the case of medical or, or businesses in the case of technology. So I, I don't see those two things as opposing aims. I think the, the problems happen when, you know, you have uh, 
like a, a a business which doesn't actually serve any any real purpose in society and and i don't i don't think it, the business that I, that I was describing like Iliad and, and so on are, are doing something that's really meaningful and they're building on the work of many scientists they're also providing a platform for more and more research to be produced that has a specific purpose as, as Paige was mentioning so wendy uh sandoval from texas asks what was the first thing you remember building as a kid David? Um, I think my, my, everybody has brought me broken stuff as a kid. And then I would like build stuff out of all these broken electronics and nothing really worked, but I sure imagined it working. And so I had this whole fake spaceship built out of spa broken electronics and I went all sorts of places in it and it was great. Uh, and so that's kind of, you know, in, building something doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it powers on building it sort of in your mind, you know? Uh, yeah, not to sound corny. Page? Um, I was very into Legos as a kid. That was my favorite toy. Um, and I had, I had this set of kind of knockoff Legos with, um, with moving wheels and stuff. And uh, with my brother, we built a miniature paper recycling facility. Um, we, we, uh, and so it, it, you, you'd feed it in, you'd feed it in the paper and it would shred it up and it didn't work very well. There was a lot of manual steps, but um, that was, that was one of the earliest things I can remember building. From Arnav Das in India. My question for the panel is, what is one piece of advice you wish you could have given to yourself when you were starting your journey with science? Anyone want to take that one on? Yeah, Paige. Yeah, so um, I, think, I think David also mentioned this, but you, I think what I wish I knew at the beginning was you are a storyteller. And it is impossible to get people to care about what you're doing without attaching a good story to it. The world is like, isn't made of matter, it's made of stories. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy, yeah. And then, and, and, and because of that, you know, uh, like matter is in space time, but stories is in people. And so you have to really also to be really like, you know, it's important to not just consider the development of your technology, but the development of your relationships and your network and your social, the fabric in which that you your stories move through and uh, or any ability that lets you push that out there better um, and you know just like um, how like ideas will build over time the uh, friendships and relationships build over time too you know and so like it's uh, you want to put yourself in a situation where you have compounding interest in all of these areas and so you don't have to spend all of your time at parties I know a lot of us didn't like parties when we were kids but you know sometimes that one party you know was actually worth something so just you know it's like the 10, the 20, the 20% 20 of the effort that, get, that gives you 80% of the value, like make sure you're doing that. Yeah. So from, from Idaho, uh, Nicholas Medapali asks, My question to the panel is, how can you ensure that you have job security and how can we prepare for jobs that don't exist yet? Thank you. Anyone? Yeah, I, I think- Ramji? Increasingly today, it's obvious that you don't <laughs> and that their ingenuity is the only thing that we can count on is having to reinvent ourselves constantly, right? So old line businesses, which had stable job security are, you know, when in 2008, there were massive layoffs in the financial security or financial industry, which was considered blue chip. Now there's job insecurity and in travel. And, you know, obviously we're all hopeful that that comes back, but the, the only thing you can count on is a replen like a renewable source of ingenuity and constantly thinking about, okay, the world has changed, what are customers going to need next? And what are customers going to need in six, 12, 18 months that I can team up with other people to, to help them serve that need? So I think that is the, in terms of job security, that is, uh, is, is one piece of advice. Yeah, ima imagine the future and then see what's miss, you know, missing and then build that, you know? Mm -hmm. I think another key, another key is to um, really learn to learn. And that's, you know, rather than, rather than learning any one particular skill, I, I, I think you should learn skills, but, but focus on, on learning to, to learn and, and demonstrate that in your, um, in your activities that you can learn and you, you can um, learn quickly and adapt. If you're looking for a job too, like it's just important, like be aggressive and no one will ever be upset with you for telling them that you want to work for them or that you want to work with them. And like, I always used to be scared reaching out. But like, there was really no reason to just reach out, be like, hey, I really like what you're doing. I'd really like to work with you. Is there anything I can do to help? 
And you'll be surprised. A lot of times people will say yes, and they'll, and they'll actually respect that you proactively came to them because most people are not, are not doing that. That's wonderful advice. This question's from Taylor Coda in Pennsylvania. My question is, besides the coronavirus pandemic, what do each of you consider to be the current most scientifically pressing issue that needs to be addressed? So I think it's uh, fear and the stress response in that if you could address fear, like you could unlock a lot of basically courage, people standing up for themselves, exploring a scientific discovery. So it can multiply across many, many domains if you're able to understand why people fear or when people feel fear and then kind of giving them courage in that moment to take on something. Hey, um, definitely climate change. I'd have to go with climate change. David. I think a lot about scaling science beyond people. So, you know, we, now that we understand the scientific process, how can we automate it? How do we have machines actually become scientists with us and just, you know, run thousands of robots in parallel and do all these experiments. And then we just, you know, we, we watch and we, and we, you know, build the machine that solves the problem. And we're at that point where we can build machines that solve problems. So how does that apply to science? And where do we take that? And Emma Leggett uh, Budin in Australia asks, in your opinion, what are the three characteristics of successful entrepreneurs? I'm going to ask each of you to give one so we can go around quickly. Paige, what is one successful trait? Uh, storytelling. David. Persistence. You don't see the 10 times they failed, you see the one time they succeed. Ramji. Learning and you know, staying close to the customer. Jack Griffin of Massachusetts wants to know. How do you tell the difference between a dead end and a time when you just need to push a little bit further in your research? Thank you. Anyone? Uh, David. Oh. I, I have a lot of researchers and we have this rule where, you know, basically don't spend too long on any one thing. Like go push a little bit. If it doesn't work, put it on the shelf and then go to something else. And then if, you know, if that works, keep going. But if it doesn't, now you can come back to the shelf, take it back off. So the most important thing is make sure that, you know, if something doesn't, isn't working, put it on the shelf, try something different and come back to it. Because sometimes when you come back to it, you'll see it totally differently and now you'll actually be able to do it. What about you, Ramji? How do you, how do you deal with the dead end? Well, sometimes it's just a matter of where the world is in terms of science. And you could be, there are two ways to think about it is the more you start putting real money or real time behind it, then you'll much more likely to find uh, something either works or doesn't. And if it's not working, it may just be a condition of that, that time or a artifact of that time or where the technology is. And like David said, you may be able to revisit it down the road. So there's no one hard and fast rule though. How about you, Paige? That's a really that's a really tough question. I think it depends a lot on the situation you're in. Um, uh, for me, it's it's kind of you've got to make sure that whatever whatever you're doing, you care about it. Um, so that's that's a clear sign of a dead end for me. Um, if if you realize that you don't care about the problem you're solving, um, then there's it's going to be hard to convince others to care about it too. So passion plays a very strong role in that piece, it's right? The, Your passion. Yeah. This question comes from Australia. Edward Garth wants to know. How would you inspire students who see no hope in their world? Anyone? David? Paige? I mean, we, we, it's, it's interesting to, there's been a lot of times in human history where we've had hardship. You know, it's uh, a lot of, uh, we may not remember a lot of them, but, uh, you know, in the 80s, we were, people were scared of somebody pushing a button and just everybody on earth dying from nuclear winter. You know, in, in, in World War II, people in London were getting bombed from, from missiles coming down from suborbital trajectories. And during all of these times of hardship, people didn't say, you know, uh, there's no hope. They would say, stay calm. There is hope. We can do this. And, you know, I think that any hardship we have now, if anything, uh, you know, may actually pale in comparison to the hardships that we've already conquered. And, and, uh, and, that's, and, and, that's, and because we've conquered those things, the problems that we have now are not as bad anymore. We're, we're getting to a better place. And so it might seem like the worst thing that's ever happened. And, it, and honestly, for a lot of us, it is the worst thing that's ever happened, but it isn't the worst thing that we haven't overcome. Ramji? Find somebody else that, or find someone that you want to, to give hope to, right? So forget about yourself for a second and think about somebody else that you want to do that for. And that is in many cases more motivating because you know there are a ton of logical things about why, why you can maintain op optimism, but if there's somebody that, that you care about, I think that will also help them get hope too. 
And our last question from, from a finalist. This question is from uh, Dimitar Chakarov in Bulgaria. My question for the panel is, what is one question, be it scientific or not, that is particularly interesting for you at the moment? It doesn't need to be in your main field of study. There's something that's truly interesting to you? Hmm. I'm, I'm really interested in the psychological question right now of how on earth do we convince people who are protesting the stay-at-home orders that they have to stay at home? Um, it's, a, it's a really critical question and a very time-sensitive question. And uh, I, I'm definitely not in the field, so I don't have a, a, a lot of capacity to, to investigate this question, but it's, it's something that needs to be solved. How about you, David? Um, there's this, uh, people like to talk about how like we have to be careful on Earth and we have limited resources, but the Earth is in space and, and space actually, there's a lot of it. And NASA, NASA did a study recently showing how, you know, if you, if you put a hundred years into doing robotic, uh, economies in space, within 100 years, you could have 100,000 times the economic output of Earth just in space with robots running without people. So I've been thinking a lot about this lately, self-replicating robot space economies. So maybe, maybe actually a lot of things that we think are limited are not. And maybe if you just build something that builds something more, a lot of the things that we're used to as limits of humans just don't exist. Maybe we can get to the future with, with, with sort of unlimited material well, for whatever that's worth, hopefully there's, there's more to it than that, but we can solve those problems too. How about you, Ranji? I think, you know, the question I'm interested in is how do you accelerate the transition to plants or like not eating animals? And so that's just an interesting question I've picked up on recently or using animal products like, you know, tasty alternatives to half and half. So that's uh, not related to coronavirus, but just something I'm interested in. So we're at our very last question, but the question comes from me. <laughs> um, if, if you were given a hundred million dollars today, what would you do with it? What would you do with it? Who wants to take um, that one first? David? I've spent a hundred million dollars. And the interesting thing about money is that it doesn't scale linearly. So a hundred million dollars doesn't get you a hundred times more than a million dollars. And in fact, sometimes just the first hundred thousand just completely changes what's possible. So I think if I had a hundred million dollars, I wouldn't spend it on one thing. I would try to figure out a way to actually to, to give it to a thousand little projects that would actually change what's possible. How about you, Paige? I think... So coming back to um, my kind of excitement about the, about the Mars colonization problem, I think I would invest it until, um, I, until humanity is at a point where we can start going to Mars. And then once we have that initial foothold developed in Mars, invested into creating a colony. Ramji? I'll look at these human physiological responses and potentially look at sensors that can help reduce stress or fear. And I think that is a kind of interesting initiative. And then also look at either investing or setting up something in, in the, the plant-based area as well. Wow. What an amazing conversation we've had for the last 45 minutes. Um, the three of you are pretty extraordinary human beings. And I know the young people throughout the world who are listening to you are going to say, I want, I want to grow up to be like this person. I want to grow up to be like David. I want to grow up to be like Ramji. I want to grow up to be like Paige. I can't tell you how extraordinarily thankful and grateful I am for your time and, and for doing what you do for the world. Um, what, an, what, a, what, what an honor uh, to have spent time with you this afternoon. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.